Today's hearing covers a topic which I believe is of utmost importance. In fact, I think there's nothing more important, and that is restoring America's competitiveness. For decades, America was the world's place to do business. We had the best education, quality of life, workforce, access to capital, infrastructure, and economic markets. But in the last 50 years, that has changed. We have watched as millions of American jobs have moved overseas. It is not necessarily that we have regressed, but our competitor, competitors worldwide have improved. We must change the attitude that we are the only game in town and improve our competitive standing in the world if we want to reverse this trend. We cannot maintain the world's highest tax rate and regulatory burden and expect job creators to return. A nation's competitiveness is primarily based on its firm's ability to compete across global markets, while at the same time raising the standard of living for all citizens. I was sent to Washington to work on solutions that will boost our economy and create jobs for all Americans, and restoring our competitiveness is necessary for achieving both. To ensure competitiveness, America's broad economic policy must focus on helping businesses increase long-term productivity. This means promoting policies that give our firms the ability to be the best in the world, such as reducing onerous regulations. Fortunately, this afternoon, we have Dr. Michael Porter, who has extensively studied this issue of competitiveness and has eight broad policy changes he believes will allow our nation to experience substantial economic growth. It is important to note the impact of these policies will have on small firms. For example, as a tax attorney, I know the challenges faced by small businesses in trying to figure out the nation's complex tax code. The Committee on Small Business has previously held hearings on the burdens of this, and reforming the tax code will go a long way in helping America's small businesses. However, a complex tax code is but one part of the burden. As we will hear today, a holistic approach is necessary to truly ensure that companies are able to be competitive. As we all know, a diet is nothing without exercise. And while one will help to be successful, you must do both. Competitiveness is the same way. One is good, but to restore America's competitive edge, we must combine various factors until we have created an atmosphere that propels our businesses to the top. Additionally, while Congress must work together at the federal level to create policies, it is important to remember that the businesses themselves can lead the way in their local communities. For example, throughout many parts of the United States, area employers are working with community colleges to develop curricula that would allow the companies to hire local students with requisite skills such as advanced manufacturing. This sort of initiative is necessary, and I applaud these efforts. We need companies who are aware of the challenges in their industry to, whenever possible, take steps to address those concerns. Today's witnesses truly understand both the challenges and conditions necessary to restore America's competitiveness. And I thank you all for being here. I look forward to your testimony. The road to reviving our country's competitive edge is an increasingly, in an increasingly global economy will take hard work, but is work I'm committed to. I now yield to my ranking member, Chu, for her opening remarks. Mrs. Chu, hold on just one second. All right, we have been called for votes, obviously, but if you want to go ahead and make your open now or you want to wait till we come back? Can we wait till we come back? And okay. We have more peace of mind here. All right, that sounds good. As you can see, we have 11 minutes uh, before we're supposed to, before the first vote ends, so we're going to have to recess this uh, hearing. We'll be back here in about, I'd say, 20 minutes. Thank you. We'll call the meeting back to order. I was walking back over with Congressman Mulvaney, and he was so disappointed he missed my opening statement. He wanted me to do it again. But I said, no, I'm going to decline. <laughs> <laughs> so at this time, I'll yield to Ranking Member Chu to give her opening statement. 
Well, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning. Oh, well, actually, it's good afternoon now. <laughs> uh, today's hearing will provide insights into U.S. competitiveness and what we as policymakers need to do to keep America one step ahead of this rapidly changing world. Uh, Professor Michael Porter and his team at the Harvard Business School have spent years studying this topic, and today Professor Porter will share the insights that they put forward in their study, Restoring U.S. Competitiveness. Among the suggestions we will hear are um, about the need to reform our tax code and fix our immigration system. I look forward to exploring each of the witnesses' recommendations on how we can make America more competitive. American competitiveness is so fundamental to what makes this country great. The United States continues to be the world's largest economy with a gross domestic product of nearly $15 trillion, followed far behind by China at only $7 trillion. We continue to be the world's largest manufacturer. Our military's power and technological capabilities are rivaled by no other country on earth. In my own state of California, we have Silicon Valley and Hollywood, the world's leaders in technology and entertainment industries. Small businesses are central to achieving this high level of innovation. Research has found that small firms are much more likely to develop emerging technologies than our large firms. Although small firms accounted for only 8 percent of patents granted, they accounted for 24 percent of the patents in the top 100 emerging clusters. Ensuring that small firms have the tools and resources they need to continue this work is critical to not just their own success, but also for America's leadership in the global economy. In recent years, however, both small and large businesses are struggling to recover from the recession, and experts worry that as a result, America is losing ground on competitiveness. Americans' wages have been stagnant for years. Our roads, bridges, and ports are crumbling. Our immigration system is broken. And scholars and experts worry that the U.S. is falling behind on manufacturing, education, infrastructure, and innovation. Today we will hear experts share with the committee a variety of policy recommendations on how to make America the leader in global competitiveness. One of those key issues is improving the tax code. I certainly agree that we need tax reform to make the code simpler. I would ask, however, that we keep in mind a recent study by the Government Accountability Office which found that most American profitable companies only pay a fraction of the taxes they owe under the official corporate rate of 35 percent. When they take into account deductions and legal loopholes, American corporations paid a 12.6 percent tax rate on corporate profits. So as we engage in a conversation about tax reform, we must ensure that corporations do pay their fair share and that our country's middle class and small businesses don't end up carrying the tax burden. Corporate tax reform could also have a significant impact on small business by eliminating the deductions that uh, small businesses care about the most. So as we start having a conversation about corporate tax reform, we need to ensure that small businesses are not negatively affected. One of the policy recommendations that we will hear about today offered by Professor Porter concerns the importance of reforming our immigration system by allowing high-skilled individuals who study in American universities to stay and work in this country. Indeed, immigration reform is vital to maintain American competitiveness. Immigrants have made extraordinary contributions to America, including iconic successes like Intel, Google, Yahoo, and eBay, uh, which were started by immigrants in the Silicon Valley. And um, in fact, it is the world's hub of innovation where immigrants helped found half of all technology and engineering companies, many which began as small startups. I would point out, however, that we won't be able to attract the best and brightest if those with employment-based visas can't live and work in the U.S. with their families at their sides. That is why fixing the family-based visa system is also critical to fixing America's competitiveness. In fact, immigrants are twice as likely to start a business as native-borns, and there are many who have come to the U.S. through the family visa system. Comprehensive immigration reform is a key issue in Congress right now, and it is my hope that we will be able to reach a bipartisan agreement that will put us back on track to restoring America's competitiveness. With this in mind, I'm looking forward to hearing to today's hearing, which will provide insights into what our country needs to do to remain the most competitive nation in the world. Thank you, Chairman Rice, for convening this hearing, and I yield back. 
Uh, thank you, Ranking Member Chu. Uh, if additional members who have an opening statement prepared, uh, I ask that they submit it for the record. I'd also like to take a moment to explain the timing lights for you. You will each have five minutes to deliver your testimony. The light will start out as green. When you have one minute remaining, the light will turn yellow. Finally, it will uh, turn red at the end of your five minutes. We'll be a little liberal on that. Uh, I ask that you try to keep it to that time limit, but we will be a little lenient if you're close to finishing. Uh, this time, we'd like to go ahead and proceed with the witnesses. We'll start out with Professor Michael Porter. Uh, Michael Eugene Porter re received a BSc with high honors in aerospace and mechanical engineering from Princeton University, where he was elected Phi Beta Kappa and Tau Beta Pi. He received an MBA with high distinction from Harvard Business School, where he was a George F. Baker Scholar, and a PhD in business economics from Harvard University. Professor Porter is the Bishop William Lawrence University Professor at Harvard Business School located in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where he also leads the Institute for Strategic Strategy and Competitiveness. Professor Porter is widely regarded as an expert in competitiveness and economic development and generally recognized as the father of the modern strategy field. Most recently in February, Professor Porter, along with his colleagues at, the Har at Harvard's Institute for Strategy and Competitiveness, released a study which examines America's business environment and recommends actions that can be taken at the federal level to, con to restore competitiveness. Thank you for being here today, Professor Porter. You have five minutes. You may begin. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Rice and other members of the committee and, and, and visitors for attending today. And we're, we're here to, about, uh, to talk about a topic that is anything but a soundbite. Uh, this is a complex topic, and I think, uh, I think when we approach this question of competitiveness, we have to approach it with, with the understanding that, uh, that there's a lot of moving pieces here. And uh, when we think about it, we have to think rigorously and we have to think strategically. Um, we can't think that competitiveness can be solved by one magic bullet, one simple solution will solve this problem. It, this is a problem that's been building for many, many years, and it will take us a, a really a strategic focus to, to address it. I would like to just make five basic points in my opening statement, which we can explore in more detail uh, as the uh, hearing proceeds. Uh, first point uh, is, what do we mean by competitiveness? And, and we talk about competitiveness. Competitiveness uh, occurs when businesses based in a location like the United States can meet the test of international competition while improving the standard of living of the average citizen. Uh, competitiveness is not just about businesses being competitive, it is also about uh, the average worker doing well. We have to do those things together if we are going to be truly competitive. If, if, if businesses succeed by cutting wages and uh, laying off people, that is not success. That is not being competitive. That is a sign that we are not competitive. That is a sign that we can't sustain uh, and, and grow the prosperity uh, of the average citizen. Um, so much of the debate about competitiveness is really uh, clouded and confused by a lack of understanding of this basic truth. Republicans tend to focus on businesses doing well. Democrats tend to focus on the average worker doing well. But of course, competitiveness is when we can do those things together. We are really all in this together. And, uh, and the only way we can achieve those dual objectives is by improving productivity. We have to create the most productive business environment, if we can equip our workers to be productive, uh, then they can support uh, high wages. Then we can have a rising standard of living. But if we can't be productive in America, if we can't uh, be at the vanguard of efficiency and productivity in how we do business in this country, we are simply not going to be able to keep up anymore because our other nations around the world are making rapid, uh, very rapid improvements in their business environments and the skill bases of their populations. So, so competitiveness is fundamentally about the question of making America productive. Now, the second point I would like to make is that there is really undeniable evidence that the U.S. Uh, as an economy is facing a fundamental structural competitiveness problem. This is not a cyclical problem. This is not a recession. This is something different. Why do, I, why do we believe that? Because all the indicators that signal declining competitiveness uh, have started declining well before the 2008 recession. 
Uh, you see here a slide about job growth. The American job machine started sputtering in the 1990s. It didn't start sputtering in 2008. Uh, the wage growth uh, of the American households has been stagnant for decades. Um, the, uh, th this is a, th and, and this problem is the mother of all issues. If we can't address uh, these conditions which have allowed us to uh, not sustain job growth and not sustain wage growth, we can't deal with these conditions and these problems. Uh, we are going to have rising inequality. Uh, we are going to uh, lose our influence in the world. Um, and we are not going to be able to really uh, renew the American dream. Uh, this is the mother of all issues. It affects all the other issues. If we can't solve the fundamental problem of competitiveness and economic vitality and job growth and income growth, uh, we are not going to have the resources to really do almost anything that we want to do as a country. Now, to address this problem, we have to address the underlying causes. And here is kind of a synthesis of what we found from our Harvard Business School research is really kind of the balance sheet of the United States from the point of view of competitiveness. Luckily, we retain some profound strengths. You see those on the upper right-hand corner. We are innovative. We are entrepreneurial. Uh, we have well-developed clusters. We have a lot of strengths, strengths that are powerful and profound in the modern global economy. But we have allowed uh, some of the more basic elements of our business environment to erode. Our skill base is eroding. Our infrastructure is eroding. Our, our public education is not up to snuff. Our tax code is uncompetitive. Our regulations are too costly and too time consuming. Our litigation and legal system is too costly and too time consuming. As a result, although we retain key strengths, they are being weighed down by these growing weaknesses, uh, while other countries are making rapid progress in fixing the very things that we have allowed to erode. So in order to address this problem, we have to tackle these fundamental challenges, and that leads to my fourth point. We need a strategy uh, in Washington to address those things that are really on the critical path. And, and these are the eight areas uh, that we have determined uh, really are the most pressing issues. These don't address all the problems we have in American competitiveness, but they really get at the things that we find and we believe are really core to making progress over the next three to five to, to seven years. Uh, uh, immigration uh, of highly skilled individuals uh, is part of the broader in immigration problem, but it is the part that really matters to our competitiveness. Simplifying the corporate tax code by cutting the rate and ending the loopholes is something that is common sense and I think most people agree on. Um, more controversial is our international taxation system, which is, is locking lots of money outside of the, uh, outside of the U.S. Uh, and and is, is, is unique in the world uh, and is, it, is, it is not supporting really the growth of our, of our businesses. Uh, uh, the trading system is, uh, there's many uh, weaknesses in the trading system that is working against the U.S. economy. We have to lead the reform of that system. Um, improving infrastructure, simplifying regulation, uh, being, getting, uh, getting on with the great opportunity we have in shale gas and our energy reserves, and then finally creating a sustainable budget. None of these things probably sound even remotely surprising to any of you. This is pure, unadulterated common sense. Uh, but these are the areas which we found, if we could make some headway on these areas, not seek perfection, not seek everything everybody wants, but just move ahead on these areas, it will have a transformational impact on business confidence, on business investment, and, on, and will start building momentum in this economy again. Uh, so uh, let me conclude there, uh, and, and of course we can have a fulsome discussion of this complex topic over the, over the coming uh, balance of the hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Professor Porter. I now yield to Representative Hanna to introduce Mr. McConaughey. Thank you. I'd like to report that I'm not just pleased to represent you here, but uh, pleased to be a customer uh, you, and my wife. Uh, today I'm honored uh, to be here to introduce Jim McConaughey, the Chief Financial Officer of Chobani, which is headquartered within my district in Norwich, New York. Chobani was founded by Hamidi Yulakara, a Turkish immigrant to our nation uh, who began modestly in 2005. It received an SBA loan to start making Greek yogurt so many individuals around the world enjoy today. Chobani has experienced rapid growth, growth and success despite a very rough economy and, as I said, is a worldwide brand. Today, Chobani grosses $1 billion 
and employs over 2,500 individuals. Chobani's story is uniquely American, and its success has invigorated dairy farms and communities in upstate New York, where we are proud to call you our neighbor. Mr. McConaughey, I look forward to having you share Chobani's experience is with us today. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you, Mr. Hanna, for the introduction. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify at today's hearing. Uh, as Congressman Hanna said, I am Jim McConaughey, the Chief Financial Officer of Chobani. The Chobani story is one that could only happen in America. Where else could a Turkish immigrant transform a shuttered factory into a thriving food manufacturing business in just a few short years? Our story began in 2005 when, with the help of a Small Business Administration loan, our founder, Hamdi Ulkaya, acquired a former craft plant in central New York. Two years later, the first cups of Chobani rolled off the line, and today, Chobani is the number one selling brand of Greek yogurt in the country. In less than six years, we have grown our business from nothing to over a billion dollars in revenue. We have expanded our reach around the globe. We have invested more than $700 million between our original manufacturing facility in New York and our new plant in Twin Falls, Idaho. We are no longer a startup with five employees, but a global organization with a workforce some 2,600 strong. It is the American dream come to life, proving that if you truly believe in something and work hard, anything is possible. Of course, with opportunities, there are challenges for the future of Chobani. Chobani's success is strongly burdened by the current Federal regulatory and legal environment. The most, four most prominent challenges I will touch on today are the lack of an FDA standard of identity for Greek yogurt, geographic indicators in international trade, trade in dairy products with Canada, and tax reform. First, Chobani strongly supports the establishment of a standard of identity for Greek yogurt. The Food and Drug Administration establishes standards of identity for various food products. Um, I'm sorry for various food products to reduce consumer confusion. Unfortunately, the current FDA standards of identity for yogurt are extremely outdated and do not take into account current manufacturing processes. The definition does not reflect the composition and the processes used to manufacture Greek yogurt, which is very tra different from traditional yogurt. The lack of a proper standard of identity for tr true Greek yogurt literally allows any product that meets one of the current FDA standard definitions of yogurt to be branded as Greek yogurt regardless of the composition or the processes used to manufacture it. USDA's Child Nutrition Program routinely follows FDA standards of identity for products used in their programs. The lack of a standard of identity for true Greek yogurt makes it difficult for consumers and the USDA to differentiate between yogurt and Greek yogurt for purposes of nutrition programs, including the proper allowances for meat and meat alternatives in the Child Nutrition Program crediting. FDA and Congress must recognize and address this blatant inequity in order for the rapidly emerging market for Greek yogurt to meet its potential without misleading consumers towards a product that is not true. An update to the 30-year-old standard is clearly in order. Second, we have seen an increase in challenges of the labeling of common food products abroad. We recently embarked on a costly and difficult process in England and Wales after it was incorrectly, in our opinion, ruled that the term Greek on our true Greek yogurt misled consumers into presuming that it was from Greece. The EU position puts common food names at great risk. If this problem is not dealt with soon, the EU's aggressive actions to monopolize common food names such as bologna, feta, and provolone will damage sales of many popular food products around the globe. Arguing that a small group of EU producers should have an exclusive right to use such name is like claiming that only Italians should be able to use the term pizza. Protectionism is protectionism, no matter how you couch it. On a third point, Chobani recently engaged in an extensive process to bring our products to Canada. This process included researching the ability to import yogurt into Canada from the United States and to explore making yogurt in Canada for Canadian consumers. In the case of importing yogurt, we found this to be essentially impossible, as there is a 237.5 percent duty at the border for all imports into Canada. This is despite the quote unquote open borders promulgated by NAFTA. As an alternative, we attempted to buy land and build a manufacturing facility in Canada. When this plan became visible to our competitors, they launched a series of actions directly against various Canadian government agencies and the local Chobani entity to stall our Canadian plans. 
despite the fact that we and the Canadian government prevailed in court, all of the previous market barriers continue to exist. Accordingly, we recommend that Congress and the administration use the TPP umbrella to look at the closed borders for dairy with Canada. Last, we understand there are many discussions surrounding tax reform in the halls of government. We wholly support this effort to eliminate inconsistencies in the taxation of different types of U.S. entities and to have a globally competitive tax system. We, Chobani, thank you for your support of a fair and competitive business environment. Thank you, Mr. McConaughey. Next, I want to introduce uh, Mr. Smythe McKissick. Since 1988, Mr. McKissick has served as the President and CEO of Alice Manufacturing Company in Easley, South Carolina. For 90 years, four generations of the McKissick family have led Alice Manufacturing Company. Alice is widely recognized today as a modern and successful textile company, as well as an important part of the upstate community. Mr. McKissick also serves as a life trustee of Clemson University. He has previously served as the chairman of the South Carolina Manufacturers Alliance, chairman of the National Council of Textile Organizations, co-chair of the American Manufacturing Trade Action Coalition, and is an independent director of People's Bank Corp, Inc. He is a graduate of Clemson University, has an MBA from the University of South Carolina, which is his redeeming factor. He, is, <laughs> he and his wife, Martha, reside in Greenville and have three children. Mr. McKissick, welcome. Chairman Rice and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. My name is Smythe McKissick, and I'm the CEO of Alice Manufacturing Company. We are a 103-year-old company located in Easley, South Carolina, employing 300 associates. We produce fabrics primarily for home furnishings, apparel, and health care applications. Over the years, we and other U.S. textile manufacturers have consistently invested in the most technologically advanced equipment, continuing education, and technical training. In fact, the U.S. textile industry has been a world leader in innovation, developing biological resistant fabrics, wrinkle-free fabrics, and sophisticated fabrics for military and industrial applications. The U.S. textile industry is the third largest exporter of textile products in the world. We ship nearly $23 billion worth of textile and apparel products to over 170 countries, and our proud industry employs over half a million people. Our industry is experiencing a resurgence, and we have invested over $3 billion in new technology, machinery, and manufacturing facilities since 2010. This positive trend could be further bolstered by sound U.S. trade policy, especially as our government negotiates the terms of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP. TPP is the largest free trade agreement since NAFTA. Our country, as you well know, is negotiating with 11 other nations, including Vietnam. U.S. manufacturing jobs are at stake, and it is critical that our negotiators get this trade agreement right. Prior to the Asian currency crisis, the U.S. textile industry was thriving. Overnight, as foreign currency values sank, the U.S. market was flooded with cheap goods. These devaluations allowed our foreign competitors to gain a huge pricing advantage. Thus, the U.S. textile supply chain was decimated. Our industry was cut in half, and thousands upon thousands of U.S. textile jobs were lost in the process. At Alice Manufacturing Company, we realized we had to quickly establish a new business model in order to survive. We employed two primary strategies in our company. The first was a direct sale to retail, whereby our company became a virtual vertical home textile supplier. Our second strategy was our optimization of our NAFTA and CAFTA partnerships. Alice partnered directly with manufacturers in Mexico and Central America, and this allowed for the opening of new markets for our fabrics. Our business is growing as a result of these new strategies. NAFTA and CAFTA are so beneficial to the U.S. textile industry because of three critically important provisions. The first is a yarn forward rule of origin. The second are fair market access provisions, and finally, strict customs enforcement. Yarn Forward has been instrumental in the creation of nearly $25 billion worth of two-way trade between the industry and our free trade agreement partners. It is critically important to maintain Yarn Forward and fair market access principles in the TPP. If not, the TPP could become the single greatest threat to the U.S. textile industry since the Asian currency crisis. 
Our industry's principal concern with the TPP is the participation of Vietnam, a non-market economy. The government of Vietnam heavily subsidizes its textile and apparel sector. We must have counterbalancing measures such as long tariff phase-outs for sensitive products and strict customs rules and enforcement to deter illegal trade. While our government continues to negotiate for yarn forward in the TPP, the Vietnamese government are opposed to yarn forward. They are looking for a single transformation rule of origin. Vietnam wants to import goods from China and export those goods to the United States duty free. This would put over 500,000 U.S. textile jobs at risk. More than 75 percent of the apparel produced in Vietnam today uses fabrics and other textile inputs from China. The total projected job loss in the U.S. after 10 years of a single transformation rule is over 530,000. The total projected job loss in the Western Hemisphere is 2 million. Another major concern of the U.S. domestic textile industry is that non-market, export-driven countries have been known to, art to use currency manipulation to create artificial competitive advantages in the marketplace. Currency manipulation clearly distorts true competitiveness. It can quickly negate the intent of, of trade agreements. It can cause serious job loss. Currency manipulation is the antithesis of the principles of free trade, and this practice must be addressed in the TPP. In conclusion, a poorly negotiated TPP will cause widespread job losses in the United States and the Western Hemisphere. I am here today to urge you to endorse, to endorse the textile and apparel trading rules in the TPP that are cornerstones of every major free trade agreement since NAFTA. You can take action by signing on to the Coble McHenry Pascrell Dear Colleague Letter to the USTR. I would like to thank you subcommittee members who have already agreed to sign this important letter including you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for the opportunity to be here this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. McKissick. I will now yield to Ranking Member Chu to introduce our last witness. Yes, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Cynthia R. McIntyre. Dr. McIntyre is Senior Vice President at the Council on Competitiveness. During the last five years, she has led the High Performance Computing Initiative that promotes the use of HPC in the private sector for greater economic return and competitive advantage. As a result of these efforts, the Council was asked by the White House in 2010 to create and lead a public-private partnership to help small and medium-sized manufacturers use this type of modeling and simulation. Since its inception, several of these enterprises have seen improvement to their product development process and bottom line sales projections. Dr. McIntyre holds a Ph.D. in physics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Chairman Rice, Ranking Member Chu, and other distinguished members on the subcommittee, thank you for having me here today. My name is Dr. Cynthia McIntyre, and I am a Senior Vice President at the Council on Competitiveness, a nonpartisan non-governmental organization composed of CEOs, labor leaders, university presidents, and national laboratory directors working together to keep America competitive and Americans prosperous. It is an honor to share with you a public-private partnership with which the Council on Competitiveness has been heavily involved since its inception, the National Digital Engineering and Manufacturing Consortium. This pilot public-private partnership connecting small and medium-sized manufacturers with high-performance computing via modeling and simulation is currently wrapping up its pilot phase in the Midwest. Research by the Council on Competitiveness presents powerful evidence of the capacity of high-performance computing, also known as HPC, to drive innovation and make U.S. companies and the nation more competitive. Indeed, for those who have adopted it, HPC represents a crucial edge that can build and sustain competitive advantage through innovative product design, production techniques, cost savings, improved time to market cycles, and overall quality. 
However, counsel research has also shown that many U.S. companies are stuck on the desktop, not able to take full advantage of HPC, while still others, including many suppliers to U.S. Tier 1 companies, have limited, if any, computational R&D capacity. Through additional research, the Council determined that public-private sector collaboration is the best and most effective means for quickly advancing HPC in manufacturing. Next, the Council and selected original equipment manufacturers developed a Midwestern regional pilot program as a public-private partnership with the U.S. Federal Government. The pilot program is aimed at improving competitiveness and innovation in small and medium-sized enterprises in the U.S. manufacturing supply chain. The ultimate outcome of the pilot program will be a workforce with enhanced technical skills, improved product quality, better customization of products, and job retention and growth. With these principles as goals, the National Digital Engineering and Manufacturing Consortium, known as Endemic, was born. Endemic brokers and promotes collaborative relationships that will sustain the growth of American manufacturing through job creations, creation and enhanced competitiveness. Endemic provides modeling, simulation, and analytics, education, and training access to high performance computing and access to software as a service to small and medium sized manufacturers. These services will be available through a distributed application to make U.S. SMEs more competitive in the global marketplace. A great example of how Endemic has positively impacted U.S. companies is the case of Jekko Plastic Products. LLC, a small custom mold manufacturer of large, complex, and high tolerance prod products uh, with a plant in Indianapolis, uh, in the Indianapolis area. Um, and this is a, a plastic material. Jayco's custom base includes large U.S. and international original equipment manufacturers in the automotive, aerospace, printing, and defense industries. To take advantage of a monumental opportunity to secure a large OEM account, Jekyll Plastic Products required high-performance computing to perform tasks that in-house software that they had could not accomplish. Jekyll joined the endemic program to gain education, training, experience, access to university expertise, software and hardware to successfully complete their large for, uh, compete against large foreign competitors. By employing HPC simulation through Endemic, Jekko earned a multi-year contract with a large German automotive company, increasing American exports and keeping people employed. In fact, due to increased production demand from their large client, Jekko is expected to increase payroll and hire 15 advanced manufacturing workers during the next few years. Jekyll's size is about 35 people, all told, so they, they are looking to hire 15 more. Currently, the endemic pilot program is wrapping up its federal funding, and the Council on Competitiveness and other key endemic stakeholders are working to move endemic from a public-private partnership to a nonprofit entity, which would be the conduit for new partnerships, including new public-private partnerships across the United States, states which will continue to work together to sustain America's manufacturing competitiveness. The EDA and its partners will study the economic impact of technology-based innovation infrastructure towards boosting the long-term job capacity and competitiveness of U.S. Of US manufacturing and industry. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. McIntyre, for being here. So now t comes a time when you're on the hot seat. We get to ask questions. Uh, I am going to use my time to allow Professor Porter to complete his presentation. Professor Porter? 
we, we need to equip the U.S. Congress with Harvard Business School style name cards uh, that uh, <laughs> we, we'll make a, we'll, we'll transfer that technology. Uh, I need to put this on. That's probably best off the record anyway. Um, <laughs> So, uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to take a few more minutes uh, to um, uh, com complete some of the remarks that I was uh, hoping to make uh, earlier in the, in the short time, but also, I think, reflect on the comments we've just heard, because I think what we just heard is actually a wonderful series of case studies in both the problems and the solutions uh, that, that, that I talked about earlier. Um, now, again, going back to this slide, um, I, I want to emphasize, and we heard this in the testimony, there's a lot of strengths in America. We have a lot of innovation, a lot of technology, a lot of new business models, a lot of path-breaking companies. Uh, and, and we heard about uh, the transformation of Alice. We turned about, t heard about the Chobani story. Uh, look at the amazing things that, that we can do. Look at the amazing strengths that we have in this country that are, that are in many ways unique in the world and, and still unique in the world, despite the effort of many other countries to, to catch up in these areas. But net-net, uh, the cold hard truth is we're not generating jobs at a reasonable rate. Uh, this has been going on for now well over a decade, um, and, um, and, and so we have this chronic uh, job issue. Uh, we're not, we don't have an attractive enough business environment to generate enough investment to create enough jobs. We have great stories, but net-net, uh, we're, we're not creating uh, jobs fast enough. In terms of incomes, people with high skill and PhDs are doing great. That's not the real problem. The problem is really the middle. It's, it's that great middle, the people without unique skills, without a PhD. How can we create an environment where they can prosper, where their incomes can rise? Um, in, instead, we're in an environment where inequality is growing, and that's creating all kinds of stresses and strains in our society. Um, when we look at the problems that are holding us back, it's, it's not the lack of innovation. It's not the lack of top management. It's not the lack of excellent high-end education. It's these things in the lower left. Uh, it's these basics. It's having an efficient, simple, responsive regulatory system. You know, Listen to uh, Mr. McConaughey's commentary about the FDA and getting, getting a, a, a regulation updated after 30 mm -hmm. years to deal with the changes in the marketplace. You know, look at the, the cost of that. Uh, the company's doing okay, but think of how much better it could do if we had more responsive regulation, more pragmatic, uh, that didn't slow things down and add unnecessary cost. Uh, uh, you know, look at the examples of how the trading system has not, we, we've not taken the leadership and, and not been forceful in really uh, making sure that the trading system works for America like it works for, for other countries. Uh, there was a time when we didn't have to worry about that. We were so strong that uh, we could simply uh, uh, not worry about uh, trade barriers and subsidies and restrictions on, on U.S. goods in, in Canada. But, but those days are over. Other nations have, have caught up. And uh, so, so, so trade is, is, again, one of the areas that I spoke about in, in my eight recommendations. Uh, uh, Mr. McConaughey also talked about the fundamental need for tax reform. This is the number one thing we hear in business. Just give us a reasonable corporate tax rate. We'll give up on the loopholes. We're ready to do that deal. But right now, we can't have the highest corporate tax rate in the OECD and expect uh, to be able to invest and, and renew our, our activities in America. Again, another one of, our, one of our eight recommendations. The weaknesses that we see in that lower left-hand corner actually have a disproportionate negative impact on small business. Big businesses can deal with this stuff. You know, they have the legal departments. They have the tax uh, minimization departments. They, they have multinational operations where they can kind of mitigate the effect of the uh, un unproductive American business environment. But small businesses who are basically in America, they're, they're the most affected. We can't help small businesses by passing new subsidies for small businesses to try to offset the fundamental weaknesses in the business environment. You know, that's a loser's game. We've been, we've been trying to do that. Uh, but it's not working. We, we have to fix the basic circumstances in our business environment that are leading to the anemic job growth, the lack of income growth, and, and the lack of economic growth in our economy. Um, now, who, who, who needs to take action here? Well, I think what we found through our Harvard Business School project is all the stakeholders need to act. 
there is a lot that business can do. Uh, you heard uh, Dr. McIntyre's description of a very innovative public-private partnership where businesses are actually playing a major role in, in really improving skills and improving technology and seeding other small companies. So business can do a lot, and we have been working all across the country to mobilize and, and inform business to take a more forceful role back in America again. Many businesses kind of lost the, 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 the understanding that they really had to invest in improving America's business environment. There was a lot they should be doing. Um, states and local uh, regions and cities uh, have a lot to do. Uh, 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 you know, all across the country, we see all kinds of innovative efforts at, at the state level in South Carolina, in Tennessee, and state after state in which I work, where government and business are working collaboratively together to deal with the problems that can be dealt with at the state and local level. But the real sticking point now, the thing that is fundamentally driving the poor performance of our economy is right here in Washington. This is where we are not making progress. This is the one place in our society where we don't see progress. Um, and where do we need to make that progress? We need to make that progress in those, that small set of things that is really on the critical path. Again, we, we can make our patent system better, but that's not the problem. We got a lot of patents. You know? We could improve our R&D spending. We should, but that's not the critical constraint. There's a lot of things that we can improve, and there's somebody in this town and some interest groups that are arguing that that's the most important issue, but actually the reality is that the most important issues are the things that are staring at us right on that screen in that lower left-hand corner. We, and, and, and if we move to my, my last slide uh, with those eight areas, it's those, these eight areas that when we engage with business and we survey thousands of companies and we, we scour the economy looking for what's really going on here, it's these eight areas that are the sticking points that would unlock the, the, uh, that, that resurgence of, of progress, that sense of optimism, uh, that confidence in the business community and among other stakeholders that America is actually in business again. Uh, the high-skilled immigration is a but pressing constraint. We have thousands of, of jobs that we can't fill today. Uh, that doesn't mean we didn't, shouldn't train Americans, but, but we, we need to take some steps today to get on board with what has been a great American strength, which is getting people to come to this country that can really contribute to our economy. The corporate tax code, again, we're not talking about uh, a windfall to corporations. We're talking about just bringing the corporate tax rate down to a reasonable level. And, and the price of that is going to be to eliminate a lot of these lo loopholes. It's time to do that deal now. Our, our, our alumni are overwhelmingly willing to do that deal. It's, it's the international tax system. We don't need to seek perfection here, but right now the idea that if you bring money back in the U.S., you should pay the highest tax rate in the OECD, that nobody's going to bring money back to the U.S., just pragmatically. So we've got to find a, a compromise, a way of... Of, 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 of changing that international taxation system so that it's, that it's hopefully fair for the country but also oh, fair for business. The trading system we just heard about, we, we, there's a lot of distortions there that didn't matter to us when we were dominant, but they matter now. And they're really stalling the ability to create jobs and, 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 and grow incomes. Uh, uh, regulatory costs, we need good regulation. We, we need high standards. We need safe products. But we don't need to spend years and years and years and years on process and delay and expense uh, to get there. Let, let's do it a better way. Uh, logistics and transportation, uh, we've got to make, you know, we, we, we've got to be efficient in moving goods and services around. Otherwise, uh, it's going to make even, it even harder to pay higher wages to workers, uh, and so on. We've got to deal with these areas. Now, the, the, the challenge is that, that to make progress on these common sense areas, uh, we sometimes get caught up in, you know, uh, trying to be perfect and, 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 and do everything at once. And I think what we need now more than everything else is to start making some progress on these things where we can, uh, get some momentum, and then I think you're going to find that there's a steamroller that can restart. This American machine, this American competitive machine that we have, these strengths that we have are, are sitting there uh, and, and they can be unleashed. 
Uh, but, but we've got to start the ball rolling in Washington. I think this is the critical constraint. So let me stop there, Mr. Chairman. And, and, and I know some of the things I've said are controversial, but, uh, but I, I think we all have to be honest and realistic about where we stand. We're a nonpartisan institution. We, we, we're just about trying to help you and all of us understand what's really going on. Uh, and, and hopefully this, uh, this, this, is, this is something that can start to build from this committee and this day and this meeting and these discussions to a much wider uh, process of, of really pragmatically moving ahead on some of the things that are holding our country back. Well, I, I appreciate your comments, Professor Porter. And, and you know, I, I hear people on both sides of the aisle talking about many, if not all, of these things frequently. It's just we don't seem to make progress on them. And one of the reasons I wanted you here was to see if you could uh, uh, help nudge us in that direction. I'm going to yield now to Ranking Member Chu for her questions. Dr. McIntyre, um, you talked about uh, the endemic uh, system, the National Digital Engineering and Manufacturing Consortium which was bringing cutting-edge technologies such as modeling, simulation, and analytical tools to small and medium-sized businesses that would otherwise not have access to them. In introducing these suite of services, what challenges are you facing in getting small companies to adopt these new tools? Do they need specialized personnel? Uh, or do, do the employees have the capability to use them? And, and also, what are, what are the costs of, of um, these services? Thank you so much for the question. Um, there are challenges that the small and medium-sized manufacturers face, uh, even uh, with our assistance, uh, to use these tools. I think the, the biggest problem for them is, is not having the in-house expertise, oftentimes, to understand how to use the tools, uh, the benefit of the tools even though th these tools can help solve some of the problems that they are facing. Uh, we oftentimes say that if we gave them all of the HPC equipment and all the software that they needed for free, it probably would just sit in, in a closet because there is no um, uh, person there who could actually use those tools. So getting them connected to the right expertise and, and we go to the universities who are trusted uh, uh, sources uh, and, and couple them to the universities so that they can act as educators, trainers, and consultants to help them use the, those tools. So it is a very time intensive uh, process working with them to make sure that they have the expertise that they need. And the costs? And the cost right now is uh, there is no cost to them in the pilot. The, the Federal dollars and the OEM dollars cover that cost uh, at this time. We are looking at making it affordable, uh, trying to understand what that price point should be. We have had some of the SMEs come back a second and a third time and volunteered to pay. So we are moving towards a, a pay per service. But right now in this pilot, it is uh, a free cost to them, no money out, but they must dedicate uh, human resources in order to do it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Carnegie, uh, your story uh, about Shobani yogurt is certainly most impressive. Um, and you mentioned that uh, Mr. Ulukaya, uh, the founder of Shobani yogurt, used an SBA loan to purchase the commercial real estate that became the first Shobani factory. Um, the SBA provides capital to companies that are unable to secure conventional financing. Um, what, uh, why, why did uh, the founder choose to obtain an SBA loan over conventional financing? Uh, frankly, I think it was the most cost effective and it was available. Um, you know, he was and is an entrepreneur at heart. He started the business, you know, fundamentally with nothing. And, you know, when you are an entrepreneur, capital is everything, you know, to just get started. And um, so the SBA program just was a very cost-effective program. He worked with, uh, you know, his bankers at the time, KeyBank, and they introduced him to the program and, and made it work. Um, you know, there is not a lot of seed capital available for virtually what is a startup, you know, unless you have it yourself. So uh, the SBA program was very helpful. Thank you. Um, Professor Porter. Uh, 
nearly two decades ago, you formulated the Porter Hypothesis, which proposed that uh, strong environmental regulations can actually spur efficiency and innovation and lead to improvements in competitiveness. Can you share with this committee your theory and how we can improve competitiveness by having high standards? Well, thank you, uh, uh, Ms. Chu, for that question. Uh, the, the, you know, the conventional wisdom about environmental regulation historically has been that, uh, frankly, that environmental regulation inevitably would raise cost, because if you had to be cleaner, that would be costly. Um, what we have learned from decades of research is actually that uh, uh, environmental impact is costly. That is, if, if you are dumping materials or, or, or not using resources effectively, you are actually wasting money. And, uh, uh, and the Porter Hypothesis was really based on, on, on this insight, which grew out of the early work that I did on competitiveness. I found that, that some of the countries that had the highest environmental performance were actually the most efficient because they used energy better, they used resources better, they used water better, they, uh, they, di they didn't waste resources, they didn't dump material, they recycled it. And uh, so, so, so that, that was an insight that, that I think was radical, but now it's become widely accepted in the business community. Uh, uh, and so business is now radically transforming the way it does business, the way it runs its supply chains to try to uh, minimize logistical waste and minimize energy use and so forth. Um, now, how do you achieve high environmental performance? But, well, one of, the, one of the ways you do that is you set high standards, um, standards for energy, standards for quality. Um, and uh, you know, pr providing those standards are, are set in a, in a sophisticated way. Those standards can be very, very positive. High standards are a good thing. Uh, the countries with high standards usually do well in the affected industries. But the, the, big, the big risk is is twofold. First of all, uh, there is a difference between the standards and how you actually implement the standards. And you want to have very high standards, but you want to implement the standards in a very efficient and very timely and very uh, uh, you know, non-intrusive way. And the other thing about the standards is you want to make sure the standards are about outcomes, not about the methods you use. So, for example, if you tell a company to deal with the water issue, they have to clean up the water with a particular technology, that actually is going to add cost. But if you tell the company, well, you need to improve your water use, you figure it out, and we will just measure whether you, whether you achieve it or not, then that stimulates innovation. So the, the debate we are having on regulation, frankly, is, is, is a little bit of a silly debate. We are debating whether regulation is good or bad. That is a completely silly debate. We need regulation because if we don't have regulation, we have we have we have uh, we, 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 we have we have bad outcomes. Uh, the, the real debate ought to be about do we have uh, do we have efficient regulation or 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 inefficient regulation, and there, there's really no debate to have there. We, and and that's what I am saying, and that's what our recommendation is that we need to rethink the way we go about regulation. That doesn't mean reducing the standards. That means reducing the time delays. That means catching up with 30-year-old process technology changes in the yogurt industry. Um, uh, you know, we're driving, at this moment, we're, we're driving our medical device industry to Europe because the FDA is so slow in implementing uh, new standards for medical devices that medical device companies are just saying, look, we can't wait. You know, we're going to go to Europe. The European standards are just as high as the American standards, but they just go about it in a more efficient way. So, so our challenge in America on regulation, uh, in environmental regulation and other kinds of regulation is to keep our high standards but, but, but go about uh, applying those standards in a very, very cost-effective way. That is the challenge. Uh, uh, and unfortunately, it's not easy. You can't just pass one law and you're done. You know, it's you got to go area by area by area. But we haven't yet found a mechanism to do that effectively uh, uh, in, in this country uh, so far. Hopefully, we will. Hopefully, uh, this. Well, hopefully, we can come out of this period we're in right now with. with raising the level of debate and really understanding what the real issues are and working constructively on the things that we all care about, which is creating a business environment where companies can thrive, where people can hire more workers, where we can export more, uh, and, uh, and not, re not thinking that it is a contest between business versus the worker and not thinking it is a contest between uh, you know, wealthy people and, and poor people, but, uh, but, but it is really, really a contest to be productive. 
So, Professor Porter, you, you mentioned that there are certain countries that have high standards, but is there a country that have high standards and also um, regulations that are manageable? Well, I, you know, I think one country that I think is sort of a, uh, an interesting model for us to consider in, in America is Germany. I mean, Germany has very high wages, uh, which they have been able to sustain. Uh, and they have very high levels of employment. And, uh, uh, you know, Germany has, has quite high standards in many areas, but the way they go about uh, applying those, implementing those standards is much more pragmatic, much less intrusive. Um, and, and that would be true in, in a number of other European countries a, as well. Uh, you know, I don't, you know, if we look to a country like China, that is not what we aspire to. They have low standards. It is polluted. <laughs> the air is horrible. People are getting sick. So that is not where we are going. We, we don't want to be like that. That is not going to make us competitive. We want high standards, but we want to be pragmatic and efficient and timely in how we apply those standards. And in order to do that, we are going to have to have a much more trusting dialogue between private sector and the public sector in, in, in setting these standards. And we are going to have to create new processes and methods for actually uh, setting these standards, uh, 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 really sector by sector, industry by industry. That has been very hard for us to achieve historically over the last 10 or 20 years. Very interesting. Thank you, Thank Professor you. Porter. And uh, I yield back. Thank you. I just Simple question, um, Dr. McIntyre, uh, Mr. Uh, McConaughey, and Mr. Kucinich, do you, uh, Kucinich, do you uh, agree or disagree with Mr. Porter's statements here today? I agree. Agree. All, agree. all yeses, right? Always agree as well. easy. Uh, me too. Mm -hmm. um, all of this being said, uh, I, I want to ask you a few things. You're familiar with the gentleman, Michael Spence. Michael Spence is one of my co-authors. I'm glad to hear that. Um, someone I enjoy, um, and his belief in tradable goods and uh -huh. the middle class is shrinking. Incomes are down. Uh -huh. uh, taxpayers are not there because they're simply not making enough money. A uh -huh. uh, couple things. What is what is the future like if we stay on the path we're on? Because you've already indicated in your statement that we're way behind, and it, it, way behind in the sense that we we have taken, I guess, some things for granted and the rest of the world is passing us by doing exactly what we do, mm -hmm. but doing it in many ways as well. Uh, STEM education, uh, there is much talk about science, technology, engineering, and math. M Mr. Spence has particularly um, uh, written about that a great deal. And um, how we can change the dynamic, I mean, I have read what you wrote here, but um, w what you say is so poignant to me, and it is something everybody in this, I think, in this Congress should hear, uh, is said as beautifully as you've said it. Um, I also like to give it a little more time to talk about uh, maybe Michael Spence's work mm -hmm. and what you think about his thesis in terms of tradable, value-added, highly intellectual properties being that place that the other world, the rest of the world, goes to, because we can't make what we used to make, and as well, and and be who we want to be, which is a thriving middle class who once again become taxpayers and kind of live that quote unquote American dream. Well, well thank you for, for that question. I mean, Mike, Mike Spence and I are dear old friends and uh, uh, I am very proud of him for his tremendous contribution. Um, uh, the, the point he makes about, about traded and, and non-traded is something I actually skipped uh, earlier and, and, it, and it grows also out of the work I have done. When you look at an economy like the United States, there's really, there's really two, two economies there. Uh, one is the local economy. And, and there's a certain m a number of industries that are really existing to serve the needs of the population living in California or, or America. Okay? So let's take health care. The health care industry is not a traded industry. It's a local industry. Health care services are provided to the people who live near the health care provider. Same is true with retailing. Same is true with housing and real estate. There is a, a big local economy. In fact, about two-thirds of all the jobs are, are local. They are they're not, not traded. They are serving the local region. Uh, the other one-third of the jobs are traded. Those are in industries like automobiles where we not only serve the local market, but we also serve the international or global market in that particular field. Uh, those are traded goods. 
uh, the local economy is very important. It accounts for a lot of jobs, but but the real driver of prosperity in an economy is the traded economy. It's our it's our ability to compete in those fields where. Uh, we can specialize in areas where we are really unique, and we can then expand and grow those industries and, and serve the world. So uh, Hollywood is a great example. You know, we serve the world in, 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 in you know, video entertainment and, and, and movies. Uh, that is a traded good. Uh, uh, you know, uh, software, uh, we, are, we are a global uh, player in, tra in that traded industry, and those industries serve the world. They don't just serve the, the United States. Now, the, the stunning statistic, Mr. Hanna, is over the last 20 years of the jobs that America has created, zero net jobs have been created in the traded economy, zero. And I think Mike Spence, through his work, really came to the same conclusion. Um, all the jobs that we have created over the last 20 years, net jobs, have been in the local economy. He calls it service oriented, but, and, and it's service oriented. It's some <clears throat> goods, but mostly service oriented, and um, and and so um, uh, this is just a further sign that something is broken here. That that we have not created enough of an effective enough business environment so that that traded work where we have to compete can actually be successfully done uh, competitively here. So I think it's it, it really reinforces the, the point that I'm making now. Uh, the 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 you, the point you made about 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 the middle class uh, is 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 a profound point that in, in America the problem we're having is not with the people that have high levels of skill and high levels of education they're doing actually quite well the global economy is a net plus for them um, the problem is is the people that have a high school degree. Uh, they don't have a, a, a special skills. They are very dependent on the competitiveness of our business environment. If, if we have a lot of a, a crummy business environment, then the, the, the person with just average skill, that job is going to go, because you can get that, that job done cheaper somewhere else. So what we have to do is we have to have such an efficient business environment that, that people without really unique high-level skills uh, can, can, can be employed and be productive in America. And, and that is where we have really lost out. And that is putting us on a profoundly dangerous course. Because if the upper income people do well, usually because they have really high and unique skills, and the middle and lower income people do poorly, and we have a growing divide, it just tears our society apart. And, and it erodes the support for business. And so it starts leading to policies that really work against business, and, th and then that just makes it worse and worse and worse and worse. So what we have got to do is we have got, we've got to get uh, the, 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 this, this, this flywheel reversed and moving in the other direction. If we can improve our business environment, there will be more investment here. Uh, not only will the high-skilled people do well, but the middle-skilled middle people. You know, Apple you know, was a brilliant, innovative company, but they made nothing in America. So we didn't get all the benefits of that innovation because we were not, we didn't have a competitive enough business environment so that they couldn't make anything in America cost effectively. But what if we had a better business environment? Then we'd not only get Apple's brilliance and innovation and patents, but we would also get a lot of manufacturing opportunities that, that were spun off of those innovative companies. So th this is kind of the fix that we're in. Um, the, the good news is that the really, really hard stuff, the hardest thing that we have to fix is K through 12 or you know public education. Finally, after decades of work, I think there's some bright signs there. We're working on that. The reason we didn't put it on our list is because it's really not fundamentally a federal issue. But 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 these other areas, these eight areas, we can fix those areas. They're they're not rocket science, and there's a lot of common ground. And the question is, how do we get enough weight and energy behind this to actually get it done? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Payne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this has uh, really been an uh, extraordinary panel in terms of their uh, testimony. And um, you know that when two or three of your questions have been asked before, answered before you ask them. So uh, I'd like to thank you for that. Uh, but, Mr. Porter, um, you know. In your um, submitted presentation, you also identified the need to responsibly develop the American shale gas and oil reserves. Um, with the similar environmental concerns as oil drilling, do you agree that the fracking 
should undergo the same amount of regulation or at least improve regulations such as measuring and reporting air pollution and minimizing uh, water use and improving well casing and cementing? Uh, Mr. Payne, thank you for that question. Uh, I, everybody needs to know that the great windfall that we have got in America is the shale, oil and gas. Uh, it, it, it's transformational. It, it's going to allow us to, to do things in America with a competitive advantage that we could have never dreamed of before. It's, it's going to allow us to, over time, diminish our need to import uh, oil, which has been a massive part of our negative trade balance for, for decades. So, so it is a windfall. It doesn't come easily because there are legitimate environmental issues that have to be addressed. Um, that said, there is rapid improvements in technology. And if we put in place the right kind of regulatory framework that requires reporting and inventory and and, and, and best practices in terms of technology and utilization of water and aquifers and so forth, you know, I, I am confident from everything I know and from all we have studied that we can develop this resource in, in a very responsible way that will adequately protect our environment. Uh, again, if we approach the regulatory process pragmatically and with common sense, without emotion, without, without uh, extreme you know, positions. Um, um, and uh, you know, uh, I, I, I know uh, a number of the companies in the field, and, and, and for example, Baker Hughes is one of our great American uh, oil field service companies. They've come up with breakthrough technologies to minimize water use to reduce the risk of some of the environmental impacts. So, so the innovation machine in, in, in America is working, but but we need a we need an overall. A, a regulatory framework here. I'm confident we can put one in place, but, but, but yet we don't have one now, and that's created a lot of uncertainty about whether this resource can be developed, how it can be developed, whether we should export gas or not. And, and right now we're kind of stuck in that terrible situation where we've got a great asset, but we're really we're not moving forward in, in, in putting it into production. No, thank you. And to the rest of the panel, um, uh, each one of you, if you could um, just um, address um, the um, impact um, that the education system has had on uh, your sectors, and do you have recommendations to address the negative impacts? Thank you for that question. Um, as far as uh, science and engineering education in the U.S., we certainly uh, have excellent universities and are doing quite well there. The pipeline for students going into science and engineering is a concern uh, that we, in fact, are able to produce the number of, of engineers and scientists that we need in order for the innovation uh, stream to come forward uh, you know, uh, at this point. For, for high performance computing, it is a real challenge. The expertise that I talked about um, not having. Uh, for small and medium-sized manufacturers, there's, there aren't a lot of people migrating towards um, education that would help them to um, learn how to use high-performance uh, high computing. Mm. So we need um, uh, a way of getting younger people to understand the benefits of using this type of computing technology and the education that should undergird the use of that technology. But uh, there are universities now looking at how can we do this, how can we educate the professionals now to use this, these tools. Congressman, thank you. Um, I guess I would offer two things. Certainly, we were founded by an immigrant to the country. And you know, having <clears throat> good common sense immigration, uh, certainly educating you know, foreign students in our fine universities and then inviting them to leave probably doesn't sound real smart to a guy like me. Uh, secondarily, business has to cooperate with universities to drive practical education. And uh, certainly, we have worked with a number of the colleges in our area in New York State and uh, with our recent move to Idaho uh, around manufacturing techniques and technologies. And I would say both of those things I would put at the top of the list. Immigration, certainly starting with those students that are here studying uh, and inviting them to stay, not inviting them to leave. And clearly, business has to work with the uh, institutions in its area. Thank you, Congressman Payne. 
In the northwestern corner of South Carolina, we are quite blessed because we have an outstanding K-12 system in our community. However, I would say South Carolina's single greatest problem is K-12, and, and clearly we must make improvements there if we're, we'll, we are to advance as a state. Regarding technical training, South Carolina is incredibly blessed to have an outstanding technical education system. And frankly, when Senator Ernest F. Hollings was the governor of South Carolina in the early 60s, uh, he led an effort to, to really drive great investment in technical training, and it has been growing and thriving and changing with industry needs and changing as our, our economic dynamics have changed ever since. So, so, so that is uh, quite a positive for us. Higher ed in South Carolina is terrific, especially uh, in the region that I live. Uh, and, and I'm biased. I'm a Clemson University fan, mm -hmm. but uh, but but I don't think there's any doubt. But that we must focus on K through 12 in our state and in our country. Okay, uh, Mr. Porter, any thoughts? Well, uh, I, I think the panel has made excellent contributions, and I I have little to add. I'd, I'd add a few a few points. Uh, I, I think at the university level. Um, the U.S. historically had more university graduates as a percentage of the workforce than any other country. Today we are way back in the pack. So I think uh, we still have a higher education issue, and the issue there is more accessibility and affordability, uh, and also the issue of getting people into the STEM pipeline. Uh, as Dr. McIntyre was talking about. Uh, there are some excellent efforts in that area. We can do better. The, 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 there is a critical need in the, in the, in the, in the middle skill area, uh, lots of promising uh, efforts, including South Carolina. The K-12 through 12 problem is, uh, is, 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 is a profound problem, and, and that is probably the subject for a whole other discussion. Okay. Uh, but Harvard Business School is working with the Gates Foundation and Boston Consulting Group to do kind of a comprehensive assessment of what we have learned about improving K-12 through education. There is a lot of success stories, and uh, we would we, we, we we love to share that work Thank with you. you as it rolls out. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Oh, wrong button. Excuse me. Uh, I, I'm going to ask one more question, which is going to open it up to another round if anybody else does. But uh, this is the most important thing to me as far as I'm concerned. Our, our American competitiveness in jobs is the most important thing. If we can get make progress on this front, if we can get it resolved, I think it solves a lot of other problems. Uh, Mr. McKissick, I want to ask you, uh, could you put that slide back up? The slide that was up earlier about the quadrants, M Mr. McKissick, you, do you know what your effective tax rate is at your company? Uh, yes, it's ours is in the uh, the high thirty percent range. Mm -hmm. Now, you had mentioned earlier that uh, I, I'm a I'm an ex lawyer by trade, and they say never ask a question if you know the answer. But I don't know the answer to this. So I'm trading on dangerous ground here. Uh, you said earlier that you worked with partnerships with people in Mexico to do part of your manufacturing. Did was the effect of that to get a lower tax rate in Mexico at any point, or no? It it was more about partnering with with companies that had state of the art technology and a desire to be best in class. Right, and it was also to create a new outlet for our fabrics. And in Mexico, unlike most NAFTA models, most NAFTA models are such that you do a, a level of production in Mexico and it comes back to the U.S. market. Not in our case. In our case, our fabrics stay in Mexico. Mm -hmm. We spin yarns, we weave fabrics. Those fabrics are finished in Mexico, cut and sewn in Mexico. Outstanding designs are applied to those fabrics, and they've got an incredible distribution system that goes to the Mexican consumer. So uh, to me, it, it is uh, a wonderful example, example of how NAFTA should work. All right. Let me ask you this. You're in the high 30s tax rate here in the United States. Ireland's 13. Would you be more competitive at a 13 percent tax rate worldwide? Absolutely. Well, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you ask, okay, well, what do you do with the money? Well, it goes right back into the plants. It allows you to. I mean, that's seed capital. If you're a private company, we are. That's seed capital to grow your business. So, so there's absolutely no question but that you can buy new technologies. You can get better in everything you do. If if we time. can't get our ports dug out for all of our 
environmental regulations that take so long to work through. And as a result of that, you pay 10 percent more in transportation costs than are your competitors worldwide. Are you more or less competitive as a result of that? There is no doubt that Charleston Harbor is a competitive advantage to every manufacturer in South Carolina. You know, if you look at the resources of our wonderful state, Charleston Harbor is a huge advantage, and, and uh, it's critically important that that harbor be dredged to, to uh, be able to access so the biggest of ships can come in there and ship product in and ship product out. And if we uh, close down all of our coal plants and the price of our utilities go up at 20 percent, are you more or less competitive worldwide? Well, I, I agree with, with Dr. Porter in, in that one of the phenomenal advantages we have in this country are the cost of energy especially if you're a manufacturer like ours. We use a lot of compressed air. That's what we do when you spin yarn and weave fabrics. use a lot of compressed air. We've got such a leg up on our foreign competitors in our utility costs. We've got one of the best utilities, I think, on the planet that services our area, Duke Energy. They're, they're fa fantastic. But if we don't understand uh, the criti criticality, the critical importance, they the role that they play in our economy, we're going to hurt ourselves. They are laying the golden egg, and, and I think we've got to protect that, and we've got to leverage our, uh, uh, our energy resources. Mr. McConaughey, I'm going to ask you the same questions. Okay. You know your effective tax rate? I do know our effective tax rate. What is it? Um, our effective tax rate is very low, um, basically because of the significant investments that our founder has chosen to make in factories where uh, the bonus depreciation has, you know, knocked a lot of, you know, income off our books in the short term. Um, but it, over the long term, it's going to—it's just a timing question for us. Uh, we're actually a sub S corporation, so I expect our ta effective federal tax rate will be in the high 30 percent in the very near future. All right, and and you talked about uh, operations in Canada, and I wasn't sure if you continued with that. Did you actually complete the new facility in Canada? We didn't complete it because of uh, the barriers that, you know, we found, you know, fundamentally in the trade system that protected the Canadian dairy industry. Do you have any other operations offshore? Uh, our international headquarters is based in Amsterdam, and we own a business in um, Australia, and we're exporting product from the United States to the U.K. at this time. Do you produce product in Amsterdam? We produce product in Australia only at this time in the U.S. Why is your international headquarters in Amsterdam? Uh, it's the best place to set up an international business. Why? Because of the taxes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, if your, if we can't get our ports dug out, if it takes 14 years to get permission to dig out the Miami port, and as a result transportation costs in the United States are 10 to 20 percent higher than other places in the world. Does that hurt or help your competitiveness worldwide? I think it's pretty straightforward. It hurts, right? Um, you know, for us, uh, you know, we know that, you know, cost is an, is an important factor. Most of our product actually, you know, comes from the U.S., obviously, with, um, you know, dairy being our number one input. Uh, we actually recently onshored some manufacturing. Because of the logistics costs, we actually took manufacturing from Central and South America and brought it back to the United States uh, because of costs. So we're, we pay, you know, close attention to costs, as all business people do all the time. Um, you know, and it, it's, it's critical that uh, we do it effectively. Uh, we don't just run over the environment. Nobody thinks that that's the way to go. Um, you know, Dr. Porter is absolutely right. Uh, you know, we've had a situation in New York recently. We want to bring some cutting-edge technology, and we've spoken to the folks in the New York government. We said, hey, we want to do this, but we're going to generate a lot more water. It's very clean, but it's above the quantities. And they said, hey, we can help with that as long as it's clean. That type of change in headset is critical, not just to have arbitrary standards, because that change will drive our costs down and make us much more competitive. Thank you, sir. Mr. Porter? I just want to say, do you have anything to add to that? Well, um, you know, I think uh, on, on the corporate tax issue, this is the number one issue that we heard from our, the thousands and thousands of business people that we, that we surveyed. You know, give, give us a, a more reasonable corporate tax structure that's more in line with other countries. We won't then have to play all these complicated games to try to figure out how to 
move activities and minimize taxes by being being uh, being complicated. You know, we have great American companies with headquarters in Switzerland, world headquarters in Switzerland right now. And and every time I hear see that, I just makes me want to cry uh, because that that's simply happening because we're just too far out of line. If if we could if we could bring down that rate to a let's call it a median level, it doesn't have to be low, it doesn't have to be Ireland, just a median level. And then do the trade of eliminating a lot of the deductions and special deals that have been made over the years. I think I think business is ready to do that deal. So, uh, and I think we would just I think it'd be a great. A lot of people would breathe a whole big sigh of relief uh, if if we could move in that direction. Now, how to deal with the territorial system is much more complicated. Uh, uh, I think there is room for, for compromise. Uh, I am I'm not a purist. Uh, jumping to a pure territorial system now may not be feasible. Let, let's, find, let's find movement in that direction. Uh, that, will, that will make, make progress. That, again, the, the system we have now is the one that is creating all this complexity and tax shifting and transfer pricing. And it, 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 we, we've created that ourselves. You know, that didn't happen as an act of God. We created this complex world that we live in now from a tax point of view. And I think most business people now have understood that that that's just not the way to go. It's it's not it's not good for business. So um, the question is can we can we move in, in the right direction? Can we be pragmatic? Uh, we also, uh, Chairman, surveyed the general public about competitiveness. We uh, a sample of the general public, a thousand members of the public a uh, very carefully selected sample to be unbiased in, in, in every possible way. And, um, and their number one, of, of all the eight things on, on that list that I have uh, that you have seen earlier, of all the eight things, the one that had the most support from the general public was corporate tax reform. Because I think intuitively uh, these people understood that the current system isn't working for America. I want to ask one more question. I will shut up. Go back to that other slide. At the top right, things where we are strong and improving, mm -hmm. uh, universities, entrepreneurship, firm management, property rights, clusters, innovation, capital markets, most all of those things are in the realm of the private sector. Not all, but almost every one of them, right? A lot of them. Those are the things we are doing great at. Mm -hmm. Bottom left, things we are not doing well. Oh, first, tell me where this section of quadrants came from. How did you derive this? Well, uh, this, this quadrant came from, we have done two large-scale surveys of all Harvard Business School alumni, um, and those alumni are in general in relatively senior management positions, and they are actually spread over the world. So this is a mixture of what our alumni living in Germany think and our alumni in America think, and, and this simply tabulates the survey data from our alumni. Okay, so is this like 35 people or is it 100 this is people? More than 10,000 people. We did it. We've done it twice and gotten basically the same answer twice. All right, so top right private sector doing pretty good. Right. Bo now, bottom left legal framework, regulation, tax code, macro policy, political system. That is pretty much uh, sitting right around us where we're speaking now. Thank right. you, sir. Right. This is chief. <clears throat> Well, I, I just have uh, one question, which is um, that one of the policy, and this is for Dr. McIntyre, uh, one of the policy recommendations put forward by your council, the Council on Competitiveness, is to ensure lower cost, um, easy access to high quality education and training for all Americans. And um, on July 1st, the student loan rates doubled from 3.4 to 6.8 percent for over 7 million students. What impact will this have on students already? face high education costs, and, and how could this possibly affect the American labor force? The increase in, in the uh, rate uh, to pay back loans is going to have a, an effect on time to degree uh, completion for students, uh, many of whom have to work uh, in order to um, uh, you know, so sustain themselves. They may not take out as large a loan. Uh, in order to go to school, and so they'll have to work more. So it could impact uh, time to degree. Um, it's going to have an impact on those who are able to go uh, to to college or to uh, uh, universities or even uh, uh, two year uh, colleges because of not being as affordable as it used to be. So um, it's a concern. I, I think that it um, uh, will see some of those effects 
uh, I think, sooner rather than later in terms of the number of loans. And then, um, and then decisions will, will be made be because of that. Thank you. I yield back. Mr. Hanna? All right. I, um, I want to thank our witnesses for their testimony and participation today. As we have heard today, restoring America's competitiveness is imperative to our country's well-being. I am encouraged by the firms who have managed to remain competitive despite the obstacles and changes needed that are clearly outlined by our witnesses. As I stated at the outset, I am committed to reviving our nation's competitive edge and will continue to work toward that goal. The real-life experiences shared by the businesses and solutions proposed by ec economic experts who are dedicated to our nation's long-term success will help our nation's political leaders better understand our con current environment and make wiser choices for the future. I ask unanimous consent that the members have five legislative days to submit statements and supporting materials for the record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you very much, panel, for being here. This is the best panel I've had since I've been in Congress. I've truly enjoyed it. This is really fundamental things that we need to work on, and I appreciate so much your time. The hearing is now adjourned.